the Panasonic S1H. You'd think they would have called it the GH6 since this is 6K, but maybe they have something else in mind. Or maybe they're finished with the GH series. Who knows? Anyway, this is a 6K full frame sensor. It has a Leica L mount, which is an interesting choice. I can make an entire video about the mount choice, but I won't. The mount operates like most mounts do for a stills camera or a video camera of this nature. You press the button to twist and release, and there's that big beautiful sensor. Now because it's mirrorless, that sensor is very close to the mount, and it's easy to get dust on it. There are a number of L-mount lenses available. This is a Sigma f1.4 35mm. And to mount it, you just line up the dots and give it another twist. The pin pops in and it locks in place. And it's a pretty solid mount. If you want to adapt to EF or Nikon or other mounts, there are a number of choices. Here is a MC21 adapter from Sigma. It gives you electronic control over your Canon glass. So aperture, autofocus, those kind of things. Although your mileage may vary, um, it's not guaranteed to work with every Canon lens. The MC21 cost about $250. The contacts across the bottom connect with the pins in the camera and you get some communication there. It feels pretty good, it mounts pretty solidly. You can also buy dummy adapters like this one. There's no electronics at all, it's just from one mount to another mount. There's just a simple release pin. It mounts again in the same exact way. And it also feels pretty solid. This one's only about $35, so that's a pretty budget way of getting your EF glass onto this camera. There's no contacts in the bottom, so no aperture control, no autofocus. Push the pin to release, very simple. The S1H has a familiar Panasonic shape, although it is uh, quite a bit bigger than the GH series. Here I have it next to the GH5, and you can see how much taller and wider it is. And when I spin it around the different directions, you can see it's, it's much thicker. There's a vent system behind the screen. That's for cooling that large full frame sensor. The grip is also deeper and taller. It feels heavy in the hand, especially with a large lens on it. It's certainly a lot larger and heavier than the GH series. It has all the features you'd expect from a Panasonic camera, like an excellent viewfinder, a flip out screen, except this one doesn't just flip out. It also has this smart tilting part of it. It's, I think, the only camera like this out there, and it's pretty clever of Panasonic to add this feature. The menu is familiar, it has a lot of settings, perhaps too many settings. I don't use all of the features in this camera, so the features that I do use, they're hard to find in this menu because it's so crowded. The buttons are in familiar places, and they feel pretty good, maybe just a little mushy. I found the directional thumb controller that you usually use to adjust your focus area to be a little slow to respond. Uh, I didn't really like the feel of it. It still has two SD card slots, so it'll record to both, or you can have it cycle between the two of them. Battery life is good, just like the GH5 series. It has a higher resolution, so there's more processing going on in camera. It's going to consume more power processing that resolution, and so it needs the larger battery. Compared to the GH5 battery, it's just a little longer, otherwise it's roughly the same dimensions. just has some more rounded corners on it. I took the camera out for a test drive on a little weekend vacation to Bainbridge Island. The Washington State Ferry System is apparently the largest ferry system in the United States. You load up your car and take a nice little half hour ride over to the island. First we went to Port Gamble. It's a tiny little town, has some old kind of turn of the century buildings. I uh, went to a cemetery and did some tests. I was shooting entirely handheld with a number of old vintage lenses. I didn't have a cage for this camera, so I figured just throw some old lenses on it and pull focus manually. I like working with these old lenses anyway. They give a lot of character and they still look really good. They're plenty sharp and uh, just a lot of good characteristics. I had a Nikon 135mm f2.8 lens, probably made in the 60s, so I was playing around with that. And uh, I can tell you the IBIS in this camera is pretty darn good. Panasonic's known for having very good in-body image stabilization and it shows. Even with old vintage lenses, you just have to tell the camera what your focal length is on that lens and it works really, really well. This shot is with IBIS turned on. The lens flare shows you how much shake there would have been without IBIS turned on. And this shot is without it turned on. You can see there's just a little more shake and shutter. At 135 millimeters, you're going to get that much shake. I wanted to do a little more in-depth comparison on the 
IBIS and no IBIS. So you can see here I'm going to do some pans and some tilts. And with the IBIS turned on, it's, it's very smooth. And it looks like you've applied motion stabilization in post, is the best way I can describe it. And then without the IBIS, you can see there's just a little shutter and shake. It does give it a more natural handheld look. If that's what you're after, then you can just turn it on and off. If you go into the menu, the camera icon, down to that camera icon on the bottom, second item there is image stabilizer. And right now it's turned on, you can see that hand symbol. So the image is nicely stabilized. Keeps it nice and smooth, even if I have little shakes, look at that, it's rock steady. So if I turn it off, you can see if I shake, now I get shake. And just little jitters in my hands would produce a lot of shake, like, like that's kind of shaking, it'd show up in my image. You can also assign it to a custom function button, so I put one on the, on the front, and I just, boom, like that, now it's on again. Additionally, in the menu, you can change the lens setting. So since I have a 58mm lens, I've set it to 58mm. You also have lens presets. So here I've got a, Canon, a Nikon 35, that's a 43, and a Canon 35. You can even give them names, which is pretty nice. What separates this camera from other cameras is that not only is it 6K, but it's full frame. And that's a little rare. Usually a full frame video camera is going to be very expensive, like a RED or even an RE or a Kinefinity or whatever. But this one comes in at $4,000. And what that full frame sensor gives you is your 35 millimeter lens is going to have the field of view of a 35 millimeter lens. There's no more crop factor involved. Well, I, I say there's no more crop factor involved, but that's not really true. In some of these shooting modes, there is a crop factor. It's not using the entire size of the sensor. Both of these 5K modes crop in a little bit on the side, which is pretty common for um, a less than 6K mode. But you can see here in the anamorphic mode, there's quite a big crop. It's only about a super 35 size framing, and it's not taking the full size of the sensor and scaling it down. It's just giving you a crop right out of the middle. In Cinema 4K and 4K, you can get the full sensor size, the full sensor width rather, but once you go above 30 frames per second, it then crops in on that sensor. All of the HD modes, including the 120 frame per second mode, are the full sensor width. It scales it down, which is great. The S1H does have continuous autofocus. It's not very good. It's not as good as the GH series, which isn't as good as Canon or Sony. Here I had it in one area mode, right in the center of the frame, just a little box that it focuses on. And as I come close to camera, it hunts and it shutters and it finally locks in, but there's movement. You can see that focusing movement, and then I move back. And again, it's hunting and it's jumping. It's not smooth, it's not very fast. And here I've moved to human tracking mode, which basically finds where I am in the frame and, and follows me around. But the focusing is still just as bad as it is in the other modes. This is definitely something that Panasonic can improve. We saw that with the GH5 and the GH5S. When they were released, they had not very good autofocus, but with a couple firmware updates, it improved quite a bit. And I found it to be useful. Um, a lot of people don't think it's very good, but I disagree. In this camera, it's not very good right now. It might improve in the future. Going back to these shots of the ferry, I purposely did these because of the dynamic range in the scene. We have a bright sky and, and the dark interior of the ship, and this camera is claiming 14 stops of dynamic range, and I'll believe it because um, I, I have the whole range here. It's really nice. I got all the highlights. I didn't clip anything. I have good information in the shadows there. This is um, one of the benefits of a full-frame sensor, so you get a greater dynamic range and also lower noise. Combine those two things and, yeah, you're going to get some really great images out of this camera. The color is also particularly good. Uh, I shot with the GH5 and the GH5S for uh, about a year and a half, and, and there's always something in the image I didn't like, some color shift in this range or that range. It was a little too yellow or whatever it was. I was never 100% happy with it, and I don't have that issue with the S1H. The colors are really nice. Here's some slow motion shots. This is 4K 60 slowed down to 24. And it comes with some caveats though. It crops in at high frame rates. It's also 420 color. It is 10 bit H265 though. My focus wasn't quite on the people in this shot. It was a little in front of them. And that leads me to another issue with this camera. So I'm in 6K and it doesn't output to HDMI when you record. The screen goes black. Now you do get video on the uh, built-in. 
but uh, you know, that size compared to that size or an EVF or a big client monitor, you can use the built-in EVF, uh, which is actually better for focus than this. But uh, this is a big glaring issue that they really, really need to fix. And once you, uh, excuse me, once you hit stop, there it is, comes right back. Here in the manual under HDMI output image quality around page 335, it gives you a little table here that says at these resolutions, you're going to have this output. However, up here you see when you're in 6K, 5.9K, or 5.4K, output is not possible during recording. And that's a big problem. As I mentioned, the built-in viewfinder is very nice. So you can pull focus with that, but it's not always practical to use. Say if it's on a tripod or on a shoulder rig, you can't have your eye jammed up against the back of the camera. If you can't use the built-in EVF, you can only use the screen, which is really too small to pull focus. A camera like this needs to output video at all times to really be taken serious. We'll see if the engineers can resolve this in a firmware update. I'm personally not a fan of the way you select your resolution and frame rate. Panasonic basically makes a whole bunch of different combinations uh, based on what's available, and you have to scroll through to find which one you're after, but it's confusing because there are a lot of different parameters to all these different menu combinations, and it's hard to find the one you're really after. Now they do provide filtering, which is nice, so you can filter by resolution or frame rate or codec or any of the options here, and that helps, but I think I prefer to have a menu that lets you select your resolution and then your frame rate, and it'll just filter from there depending on your previous selections. That's just a personal choice. There are some limitations to the resolutions and frame rates that you should be aware of if you're considering buying this camera. It only records 6K in either 23.976 or in straight 24 cinema around here. It does not do 6K in PAL. See, it tops out at 5.9K, a little under the maximum resolution. That seems kind of a weird restriction considering it's only one frame per second difference. And it's also just 420 color, not 422. It is 10-bit though. Let me go back up here to NTSC, and you'll see as you get away from the 5 or 6K resolutions right here, you get into cropping, so super 35 or pixel for pixel. That means you're getting less than the full frame width of the sensor. It's going to crop in, gives you the effect of having a more telephoto lens, and you're not getting as many pixels, so you're not really getting the benefit of the sensor. And you see all these 4K anamorphic modes, um, cinema 4K modes in higher frame rates, 60 frames, 48 frames, if you go down to Cinema 4K and 4K, you can get full frame right here. Excuse me, you can get full frame sent here, but only up to 30p. So there are a number of limitations uh, depending on your combination of resolution and frame rate. Also, you'll notice that the uh, bit rate changes and the codec changes as well, depending on what mode you're in. Uh, HEVC is H.265. It's newer compression, much more efficient and you're getting up to 200 megabits in this mode. Um, there's a 400 here, but it's H.264, that's what ABC is, and it's only at 23.976. There are just a lot of different combinations of numbers to look at here and to be aware of if you're after the highest quality out of this camera. Like for example here, Cinema 4K in 30p does give you full frame, and it's at 400 megabits per second, but it's H.264, not H.265. It's a bit of a trade-off. The other issues I have with this camera are pretty minor. While the S1H does give you a de-squeeze option in camera, it doesn't de-squeeze the HDMI output, so you'll have to use the one built into your external display. Once while I was out recording, the HDMI output was cutting out intermittently, and I think it might have just been a fluke. Maybe I needed to power cycle something because it only happened this time. For some reason, when you're using HDMI output to an external monitor, it switches to autofocus mode 2, and you can't use mode 1 for autofocus. I'm not sure why that is. Given its feature set, the S1H comes in at a pretty good price. At $4,000, you're getting full frame, 6K, IBIS, autofocus with potential, a great EVF, 
It has excellent image quality, great resolution, great color. It's a truly handheld camera that you can take out with just a lens and shoot. There's a lot of great features in here, and remember, it's still a good stills camera. For photos, the only difference between the S1 and the S1H is this camera has an anti-aliasing filter, which makes photos just a slight bit softer. It's cheaper than the closest camera, which would be the E2 F6, which comes in at $5,000. I'll have a comparison on those two cameras coming up after this one, hopefully. So if you haven't already, please hit that like and subscribe button, and hit that little notification bell so you know when I post that video. I'll see you then.